really welcome this opportunity to be able to hear your thoughts and questions about our city's present and future with a focus on all the wonderful neighborhoods in the area, in this area of Palo Alto. So I know we all know a lot has happened in the last 10 years. This beautiful facility was opened. A new pedestrian bicycle bridge connected South Palo Alto to bay trails and open space. The Charleston Arrastadero plan is almost complete. And by enabling mode shift, this project increased capacity of the road to carry thousands more trips each day as the Sanford Research Park expanded and hundreds of new housing units were built in the corridor area. The, pr the project also significantly reduced injury collisions, creating a safer environment for all road users, including youth school commuters. The city is now working on plans to replace the obsolete Mitchell Park Fire Station to accommodate up-to-date emergency response equipment. Many of you know that the city's draft housing element identifies sites for thousands of future state-mandated housing units in South Palo Alto, particularly in the San Antonio and Fabian Road areas. Today, we hope to hear from you about your vision and hopes for improvements to city facilities to be able to support a growing population with city, with city community services, transportation, and other improvements. We hope to hear from you on issues like Cubberly, rail grade separations, transportation improvements for the San Antonio Road Corridor, and anything else that you'd like to share. First and foremost, we are here to listen to you. We would like to share with what the city is doing to improve the city's police department and emergency service capabilities, building, permitting processes, and sustainability, and again, to hear your feedback on any of these changes. We are here to share information and to hear your thoughts so we can serve our community better. Thank you very much for inviting us. Looking forward to the conversation. need to put my glasses back on. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Stone. So here's how the town hall is going to work. We count on all of you to offer courteous questions and comments that when answered will help us understand issues better and move us toward problem solving. Our moderator, Scott Peterson, please come up, Scott, uh, from the Charleston Village neighborhood will guide discussions and call on speakers as they raise their hands. He will call speakers two at a time uh, to reduce waiting time between speakers. Arthur Keller, uh, raise your hands please, there's Arthur Keller and Peter Taskovich, Peter, um, will pass microphones to speakers when it is when it's their turn to speak. Please move toward the, mic the person with the microphone when you are called and wait for your turn. If you're unable to move to the mic, please motion to one of them and they will bring the mic to you. Uh, timekeeper Edith Lynn, right here, um, will hold up cards to remind the moderator and our speakers how long they've been speaking and when to wrap up. Please do try to be succinct so everyone, we have a lot of people here, thank goodness. <laughs> I'm so glad. Um, but everybody wants an opportunity to speak, so let's be courteous toward each other. Uh, thank you to our volunteers for being here and helping today. Here is Scott Peterson, our moderator. Thank you, thank you Scott. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in an effort to keep the uh, meeting focused, we've created the agenda. It was at the back if you hadn't uh, pick, if you haven't already picked it up. And we're going to start with uh, city staff focusing on the neighborhood uh, questions that have come up. And specifically, we're going to ask for two of the speakers, and then we'll do a Q&A at, uh, at the end of that. So for the first part of our meeting, we're going to start with uh, City Manager Ed uh, Shikata, uh, who will be talking about zoning and land use. And then for the second part of this first section, we'll deal with traffic issues and uh, Chief Transportation Official uh, Philip um, uh, uh, Cami will be addressing those. So. All right, thank you, Scott. 
as uh, actually the vice mayor touched on, uh, some of the land use uh, issues that have come up recently. So I'm just going to do a, a very brief, maybe even briefer than that, uh, a very brief uh, overview of some of the major changes in policies that have been over the last couple of years, much of it uh, driven uh, by new state laws that have been reflected in our local zoning and uh, approval processes. Uh, let me just start off by noting that for those who are tracking uh, this topic, uh, the big news this week is our uh, uh, receipt of a letter from the State Housing and Community Development Department that has uh, given comments on the draft housing element that the City Council approved uh, actually back in December, I believe, and uh, has been under review since then. As a result of that uh, of the comment letter we've received, and if you've seen the article on Palo Alto Online, it's extensive comments. Our staff is going through that right now along with the city attorney's office because this is a very structured process and we'll be coming back uh, to the city council, I believe late April or early May with a revision to the draft housing element that has been submitted that can hopefully then be approved by the city council and then sent back to the state. This really reflects a very active, uh, and I use the term uh, loosely, uh, actions by the state uh, to regulate uh, housing approvals in cities throughout the state of California. Notably, in, in the last uh, couple of years, there have been changes uh, to uh, regulations that affect accessory dwelling units. So I believe uh, most people have seen new ADUs, as they're referred to, coming up around town. Uh, also, uh, SB 35, or State Bill 35 and SB 330 that have required streamlining of approvals at the local level. We've also, uh, let's see, uh, noted the housing element. Just want to put some numbers uh, behind that for those who perhaps have not been tracking our housing element. That uh, under state mandate, we are planning for over 6,000 more uh, units uh, to be uh, approved over the next eight years. And so the housing element really identifies uh, both uh, specific locations as well as a number of programs that will be necessary in order to facilitate meeting that uh, state uh, mandate <clears throat> the state uh, the city as a result or part of that process needs to convince the state that the sites that have been identified for future housing can reasonably be developed and uh, that we uh, will eliminate any local government constraints that may impede that approval. Also, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned earlier, the reason I'm giving this presentation is our, our planning director, Jonathan Late, who you'd normally hear from and his staff, uh, couldn't make it uh, this uh, afternoon, so I'd like to uh, Extend his apologies for not being here, uh, but again, uh, we certainly operate as part of a team. Uh, next, in terms of our, uh, our uh, approval processes, we are looking to make additional streamlining uh, changes, again, mandated in order to facilitate uh, the approving, approval of housing production. Uh, and then, uh, so you can anticipate seeing uh, more ordinances that will be coming forward to the City Council over the next several months. Now, relative to uh, this part of town, San Antonio, San Antonio Road and that corridor has certainly been the um, uh, focus of much of the interest around additional housing development uh, potential. This is part of the housing element and we established a housing incentive program to uh, encourage uh, some of that uh, uh, specific projects to come forward. Now, the uh, Next step, and, and certainly as you would expect related to San Antonio Road as well as other parts of town, will be to do more focused planning on other uh, dimensions of what it would take to make a, a neighborhood successful, transportation access, and perhaps uh, Mr. Cammy will touch on that, as well as parks uh, access and the like. So the planning for that uh, is forthcoming, but again, for those who are tracking what we've referred to as uh, coordinated area plans, which are the way the City of Palo Alto does planning for specific areas, you know that that's uh, actually a very extensive process in and of itself and one that has yet to uh, be initiated. Uh, let's see, then with that, I think that covers all the, the major points for the time being and uh, turn it back to Mr. Peterson. Thank you. And now if we could have um, Mr. Cami present on traffic issues.
That's, she might freak out. I don't know. I think we'll be okay. Um, you want to help? Uh, I'm Philip Cammy, the chief transportation I official. Run. And probably I more importantly, run. this is Isla Cammy here to help me today, I guess. Um, this is amazing turnout, so thank you all for taking your Sunday to be here. Um, I'm from the Office of Transportation. Um, I'm your chief transportation official. And um, before I talk a little bit about my team and the projects that we're working on, I just want to give you a little bit of a traffic safety tip um, for your neighborhood to help it to feel safer. Um, so I just want to mention, and I guess I'm stealing maybe some of what Chief Bender might get into later, or, or maybe I'm saving you from dealing with him for enforcement. Um, just to note that most traffic incidents, vehicular incidents, happen near your home. Um, yeah, and a lot of times we feel safe and comfortable in our neighborhood, and so we increase our speeds. And so I just want to mention that you're near your neighborhood, just take a breath, roll down your window so you can listen, you can hear, um, and just slow down. And uh, with that, just talk a little bit about the Office of Transportation. Uh, we're a 15 person team um, organized into three divisions. We have an uh, engineering division that handles traffic operations and safety and um, our capital improvement projects. Um, we have a planning um, division that handles our um, transportation plans and programs, um, such as the bicycle and pedestrian oh, plan, oh, um, the uh, car-free streets projects, and, um, and then we have parking and uh, <laughs> transit operations um, that handles the parking structures, the parking programs, and also our on-demand shuttle. And so with that, I'll start talking a little bit about our programs that we work on. Um, we have a new um, on-demand shuttle. Um, it's an on-demand rideshare service called the Palo Alto Link. I hope you all um, have a chance to grab a flyer at the back. Um, but it's, it's basically door-to-door -door or curb-to-curb -curb service within the city of Palo Alto. Um, uh, fares will be um, starting on April 10th, although right now all trips are free. Um, so please give it a try right now. See if you like it, see if it works for you. Um, but fares will be $3.50, regular fares, and a dollar for um, disabled, um, senior, student, and low-income riders. Um, and that's per trip, and you book it as you need it. So when you need a ride, you call it just like you would with an I Uber or Lyft, um, but just noting it's shared, uh, a shared ride trip. Um, yeah? I, I thought she was gonna read this speech as she picked it up. <laughs> Let's wait for her a little bit. Um, talk a little bit about programs. Um, the grade separations pro program or project is the biggest project that we have. Um, one of the largest projects in the city. Um, and I guess I'll talk about that a little bit later or potentially we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we have the bicycle and pedestrian transportation plan update, um, which is looking at how we can uh, better connect our um, bike and pedestrian uh, network throughout the city and how we can expand it and how we can enhance um, utilization rates. Um, we also have our Safe Routes to School team, which is in my office, um, that helps um, with education and helps um, develop new programs for kids um, to take alternative modes to school. Um, and um, I mentioned earlier we have the Car Free Streets program, which is uh, looking at the feasibility of doing permanent uh, pedestrian zones in uh, California Avenue and Ramona Street. And with that, I think I've uh, given a little bit of a, a high level um, description of some of the programs. I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you. So at this point in time, if you have any, yeah, we will get into the questions. We need to get our microphones out so that everyone can hear. So, Terry, did you want to go? Okay. And you can address uh, to either of the two gentlemen that just spoke. I, I, thank you. It's a quick question about the uh, uh, new ride service. Uh, I'm in South Palo Alto, 
as an example, my prescriptions are at the CVS, you know, in Mountain View, unfortunately. Um, it looked like on the map I can't get a ride to the CVS in Mountain View or the Safeway, which is the best shopping for us in, you know, South Palo Alto. Is that true or is that flexible or how does, how, how, do you, how is it restricted? Yeah, unfortunately, um, and, and just to note that what we have right now is a pilot service. So we've got a, a, almost two years of funding that we've received from VTA for this service, for the, the, what we're calling the Palo Alto Link service. And it's really a pilot. So we're trying it out and we want to hear your feedback, what's working, what's not. Um, but to answer your question, one of the limitations right now is we only provide service within Palo Alto. So it's only within Palo Alto, similar to our, our neighbors in Mountain View that have a service. Um, they have a, um, a, a shuttle service that only runs in Mountain View. So unfortunately, we can only access Palo Alto. However, that said, if, for instance, there was a drugstore that you could pick up um, your medication in, in Palo Alto, even if it's further away, that is something that you could access um, for the same price uh, with the Palo Alto link. And also noting that we go very close to that shopping center um, in Mountain View. Um, it, it is a little bit of a walk though, a few blocks. I think it's like three blocks. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Dick Carp from Green Meadow. Uh, maybe the owner is here, but every day on my short drive home from work, I pass an almost complete McMansion on McKay Street that um, to me, it looks a lot, maybe the owners here and can comment, to me, it looks a lot like a car dealership. Uh, <laughs> and I'm wondering if there's any reason not to be controlling this sort of thing that's not at all representative of the neighborhood all around it. I know that's a peripheral issue and not the most important, but I'm just curious about that. Well, I think, uh, or I assume, uh, what you're referring to is a, is a home, even, uh, and and appreciate the uh, description of McMansion, uh, and so the um, city's processes for approving projects like that really do try to ensure that the scale as well as uh, the design uh, does. Uh, uh, reflect the neighborhood to the extent that we can uh, from a regulatory perspective. So I'd be happy to get further information about that one to see if there's uh, anything uh, specific that was happening there that might uh, bear further discussion or awareness. Hi, uh, my name is Hong Ha Vuong. I'm at the Green Meadow neighborhood. I have two questions just for information. The first one is for all of these housings that will that are on the plan to be built. Um, what are the laws already, or what can we do to ensure for low income, middle income housing, and housing for our city workers and our local teachers? So that's my first question. And for the second question, um, I remember and was slightly involved in the choosing of the different options about grade separation for the train. Um, so if I could just, we could just get a quick update. Has, a, has one of those options been chosen? Are we still discussing that? Or are we back on square zero looking at yet other options? Thank you. So perhaps just to, to address the housing question. And in fact, um, in terms of format, I'm curious, Scott, if you actually want to let any of our council members uh, respond, they, they all, may also want to chime in. So just an open question there. Uh, in general, I would say that on the issue of affordability, the city council has been uh, very focused on ensuring uh, and really encouraging affordable housing as opposed to market rate uh, uh, residential development. And we do have specific ordinance requirements for levels of affordability. Uh, that, again, I could describe in more detail, but uh, it is part of the mix. In addition, uh, the city is also looking uh, specifically at the downtown area and the possibility of uh, developing more or encouraging more development uh, there, including on city parking lots uh, that would have specific affordability restrictions. And I think some of the city council folks would like to comment. Thank you. Um, so just to follow on to that, um, in this state housing mandate is 6,000 new units over the next eight years. About uh, 24, 2,500 of them are uh, low, very low, or extremely low income 
housing, and then another over a thousand are moderate income, which actually almost invariably in our city would also need subsidies to be built. And so right now, the Palo Alto, Palo Alto has uh, several ways that we have historically provided for low and, uh, uh, low and very low income housing. Uh, we have inclusionary zoning. If there's a market rate project, typically 15% of those units have to be in those uh, subsidized categories. But that those numbers I cited to you, the state's mandating 40% plus the moderate income is really 55% need subsidies. We just passed uh, this business tax in uh, the fall, and the council had committed to a third of that, about $3 million a year, be devoted toward low-income housing, and that's on top of the funding we have. And with all of the funding sources of impact fees and inclusionary and the new business tax, we're, we have the largest wave of new affordable housing projects we've had in decades, and it is a small fraction of the state mandate. And there are no, there is no uh, way in which the funding requirements to meet the state mandate are aligned with local resources and the other resources we leverage to do that. So there's a massive disconnect there. And just to follow up on that as, as well, I mean, the council has done a lot to try to address the affordability piece. Is the more we can do? Absolutely. We continue to explore those as, as well. But to address, I think, a misconception probably across the state on the difference between our market rate housing and our affordability piece, Palo Alto, we have always made our market rate housing targets. The state has almost always, if not always, has made their market rate housing targets. Where do we fall woefully short is in the affordability piece. And how do we make that up is going to be through government subsidies mostly. There's some other lever, there's other levers that we can pull into as well. And we're, we're trying, but the, the funding piece is critical. We've raised impact fees to be able to address that. Council Member Burt talked about the business tax. Thank you to all of you for passing that this past year. That will help. It's not going to get us to that target, though. And so one thing I would encourage you to do um, Contact our state officials, contact Assemblymember Berman, contact Senator Becker, and ask for more funding. Last year, the state had, a, I think it was a $307 billion budget. That was a $100 billion surplus, and they spent $1 billion on affordable housing production. So everybody needs to kind of roll up their sleeves and address this problem. It's a city issue, it's a county issue, it's a state issue, and greater advocacy can help us get there if it's really uh, critical, which sounds like it is for you, and it is for us as well. So, sorry. And if I can, just to briefly, I, I really wanna do it briefly, address the question about grade separation, because I wanna note we have a whole section devoted to talking about that later today. Um, just wanna say that right now we're still in the um, conceptual phase for grade separation, so, um, we're still looking um, for Charleston, Meadow, and um, Churchill grade crossings. We haven't started Palo Alto Avenue, um, but we're still looking um, at five different alternatives um, at those locations currently, and we're working on uh, revisions to those. Sorry, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. I want to stand up because I know some of you guys in back probably can't see us. So I, I think it's a good question you asked about affordability. And I think there's two aspects. So one aspect is the impact fees. So there have been projects, for instance, planned along El Camino, like the Mike's Bike Project on El Camino. But because of the rising impact fees, as well as the rising construction costs, um, some people choose not to build anymore. So that's one issue. The second issue has to do with, um, and it's something which I've talked a lot about on council, which is having smaller units. So one way to make um, much more affordable housing is to actually have smaller units. Um, so if you look at the average size of the American house, it's actually getting bigger and bigger every single year. Uh, but ironically, the family size is actually getting smaller. And, um, and if, um, if you guys go to other countries like Europe or Japan or other places, you'll see that the house is actually a lot smaller. And that's one way to make it a lot more affordable. But it's a good question in terms of how do we address this issue in our city. Yeah, uh, Jason Rusoff from Green Meadow. Um, the traffic circle at uh, Ross Road in East Meadow, um, I was kind of shocked when I first saw it. I'm a, I'm a bike rider, and the bike lane basically disappears when you enter that. And I'm wondering, 
is this considered a safe design? It's also, I, my understanding is it's much too small for a, a legal roundabout. How did this happen and has this been reviewed? Uh, yeah, so thank you for that question. So the question was about the traffic circle um, at Ross um, Road. And yes, just to note, you are absolutely correct in calling it a traffic circle. I think that was one of the um, misnomers when it was originally created was a lot of people were saying it's a roundabout. And the reality is it really was not geometrically sized correctly to be a roundabout. And so yes, we did a comprehensive review of it uh, with engineering firms. And um, that's why the, the um, entry and exits um, on it were changed. We have the two-way stop um, in order to make it um, meet um, all of the engineering codes. So um, yes, um, it has been reviewed. There was a comprehensive review done by um, an external review and the city engineers, and that was uh, presented to council, I believe approximately two years ago. Uh, Ken Allen from Adobe Meadow. Um, just to follow up on that traffic circle, um, the garbage trucks can't get around it without hitting the curbs, if you haven't noticed that. Um, my questions are also related to traffic. Um, uh, what can be done about changing the uh, splits along Middlefield for the cross streets? It's as long as two minutes to get across a street where there is no traffic. I think that's something that uh, with the cameras on it, that can be a little more demand sensitive. Uh, and second, uh, how about all of those potholes along El Camino? Thank you. I love when somebody uh, brings up a, a traffic issue that um, is not our fault. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I really uh, feel for everyone driving on El Camino with the potholes. I know that Caltrans, and just noting that that is a Caltrans, uh, that is Caltrans jurisdiction, not the city of Palo Alto's, but we are coordinating with them. Um, we understand that they've been um, working to address those potholes and have a plan actually to um, repave Caltrans. I think some of the weather um, has held up their work, um, all the rain, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, Sorry, and your question about crossing, I believe, Middlefield um, was a question. And, and that's something we, we're looking at options to um, improve that. We're doing um, studies right now to look at improvements for um, Middlefield. So, uh, 6,000 units will work out to be something in the neighborhood of 15 to 20,000 people, so it will raise the population of the city by 25 to 33 uh, percent. And yet, we've designated the San Antonio and Fabian corridors as the locus. Uh, I'm delighted that we have a plan that looks like it'll pass muster with the state, but I'm disappointed that we've decided to put all of the new units at the periphery of Palo Alto. It's, it's a really good question, and I think a frustration that most of the council has had, and I think communities across the state are having right now, is, is this issue of the immediacy of, of, these, uh, of the planning of these units and the approval of these units. And I think all, I would imagine all city councils, including our, our own, would love to have been able to have the, to be able to have the time to be able to uh, develop coordinated area plans for particular areas, because I think one of the issues that you're identifying is the, the massive growth that parts of the city uh, are, is going to see over the next eight years um, is you know, we need to be able to have the infrastructure for it. We need to be able to address the traffic impacts, the school impacts, the public safety issues as, as well. And so one of the issues with these mandates is kind of forcing us to move forward in a, in a way it, it, at a faster pace to be able to address some of those. It doesn't mean that we can't do it at the same time, but I think that's going to be part of the part of the frustration and the pressure on the on the city 
moving forward to get this to get this plan passed. I, I hope I hope the state sees it the way you do as far as the optimism of this of this getting passed. We just got the response back from HCD, so I think we're all interested in being able to to see that. And of course, it's going to. Um, um, well, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to take over everything. So definitely, I uh, understand your concern. Being a, a midtown resident myself and somebody who who kind of frequents on San Antonio a lot, very concerned about um, about some of the impacts that you're addressing. So I'll, I'll just comment on the what's called the site inventory of where we're trying to designate these uh, six thousand sites. Um, the San Antonio and Fabian corridor are a primary, but not exclusive part, but uh, we had a process where we had a citizens committee with multiple stakeholders over a year and a half and a three member city council subcommittee, and they came up with these sites. When they came to the council as a whole, I was concerned that those locations were not the best sites um, in terms of housing that would really uh, fit in and build community where there are services, public services, retail services, uh, bikeability, the right transit, uh, all there. Um, it was so far in the process that we didn't really have an opportunity to, at that point in time make significant changes to the sites, but the council agreed to revisit whether uh, more of those sites should be in the two downtown areas along the El Camino corridor and the Stanford Research Park. Although I will note in the research park, we have tax issues with Stanford where rental housing there uh, does not pay normal property tax and that affects not only the city but even more so the school system. Um, Alexis, oh, sorry. Yeah, so it's a good question, right? I, I don't think it's fair to put all the dense housing in one location. I think that's not right. So I think that's a really, that's a really good point. For myself, I, I actually I think having more of the dense housing near our transit makes a lot of sense, and also near like good transit or good uh, transportation options. So uh, I really appreciate what you're saying. Um, Alexis Hamilton, St. Clair Gardens. We have been discussing on next door neighbor. Um, on a micro level housing and we're concerned that bills and fills might get turned into housing instead of a neighborhood serving um, as it's zoned now. Has there been discussion about that? No problem. Okay. Um, and uh, clearly, uh, we've heard uh, quite a bit of concern and, and caring for the businesses uh, that were impacted by the fire at uh, Bills and Phil's and AJ's. So uh, there has been no uh, discussion of converting the use. At this point, uh, really, it's still in the hands of our fire department and the uh, property owners and, quite frankly, their insurance companies uh, to work through uh, plans uh, for uh, a restoration, but even more uh, basically, uh, removal of uh, the uh, the building and uh, being able to move forward. Do you have a question? Martha Sparbori, Green Meadow. Um, my question is, and it's related to what others have asked: What kind of retail services and uh, recreational services or parks? will be available for all these new uh, residents in the new housing units. Thank you. Yep. Um, and just very quickly, uh, as I noted earlier, doing a coordinated area plan specifically for San Antonio, if that's the focus of interest, uh, hasn't begun yet. And it's something that uh, we need to plan for. Uh, it, this will be an extensive process that will likely extend over at least a couple of years. Uh, so more, more to come on that. In addition, though, from a citywide perspective, the city is currently doing an overall economic development strategy to look at where uh, needs and opportunities exist related to retail uh, and other uh, resident uh, serving uses. Um, hi, uh, Madeline Skoog, East Meadow Circle. Um, I put in on the online system on this topic many times that it never gets printed. What I think we need in the Fabian address is a police substation, and we also need a quick um, emergency station. 
because that whole area there is right next to a giant freeway interchange and seems to be the collection point for problems that come in. A police substation, a fire, maybe a fire department in the um, old Ford Aerospace facility there. Also turning that into a city um, support system which maybe has a court uh, room, a courtroom, because I'm not sure that the courthouse at City Hall is active, is that active. It seems to have impediments. Um, so that's what I'm suggesting. It keeps getting ignored by the online system wherever you are. And um, I think it's highly important that we have a police substation there because we have a huge amount of RV traffic on Fabian and we've had start starting to have some incidents there. So police substation and a, ur a quick urgency um, medical center, um, which could also give shots out, which would be good. But we need to anchor that end of the city, okay? I think that uh, perhaps we can defer part of the answer to your question about uh I, th I think we can defer part of your question about the uh, police presence to Chief Binder. He is actually going to speak in the second half. So, Chief Binder, if you could talk about what's going on in the, uh, the, the southern part of, of Palo Alto as part of your talk, that would be great. <laughs> We, we, we need a microphone. Thank you for your comments. Uh, can you hold your comments unless you have a microphone, though, please? Uh, Ken Allen did not, uh, you didn't follow up on Ken Allen's question about when we're going to get the El Camino fixed. And then here. Uh, uh, hi, Virginia Farah, Green Meadow uh, community. But I'm also part of the dog community and was um, wondering if there's any planning considerations for animal services in any of the planning for Palo Alto. We currently have no boarding facilities. We have no training facilities, and dog parks are pretty much only grassroots effort. I'd really like to make sure that in the next phase of planning, we consider animal services. Comments or no? Sure. I, well, as a matter of fact, I think later we'll have Kristen O'Kane, our Director of Community Services, speak. I, I would just note that uh, animal services will be discussed by the City Council this coming Monday. And uh, so it's an opportunity to speak to uh, where we currently are. Hi, I'm uh, Pete Squire, Charleston Gardens. Um, for the electric bikes, they seem to treat them all the same. You know, electric bikes are like people. There's some that are and some that aren't. So for seniors, like out in the Baylands, they don't like electric bikes. There's even one bridge you can't cross in Palo Alto on an electric bike. I think it's on the bike boulevard on Bryant. So I think for seniors and other people, oh, for seniors and other people, we, we should have more access to do it out in the Baylands and other places, not the restrictions. I know there's some kids that hot rod through there and stuff, but we're not all the same. Uh, no, but just noting that I, I hear your comment and I empathize. 
Um, just so we don't all walk away with a cynical view, uh, can we have the members of the city council uh, raise their hand if they've voted recently for a housing project in their, no in their own neighborhood? <laughs> I see no hands. So it was, it was tiresome to always hear the members of the city council say, because uh, I've, I've attended a couple project uh, meetings to approve projects on San Antonio Road, and the members of the city council were always, a few of them would always say, yeah, that's a great place for a project. But there's been projects proposed on El Camino outside of our neighborhood, and I, my feeling was they were probably too close to a neighborhood where the, where the mayor was at that time. Uh, so, so if you, uh, let me make one suggestion. Uh, I would suggest that the city council take on the responsibility for every member of the city council to come up with and promote one project in their neighborhood for housing. So, um, no, I didn't. first, the council has uh, supported a whole series of housing projects along El Camino over the last several years, and I encourage you to um, actually get more up to speed on that because it's just not accurate what you said on that. More broadly, uh, we have low-density neighborhoods in our community, and we have areas that are zoned and have been zoned as higher density for a long while. We've increased the zoning along the El Camino and elsewhere, but as the city manager mentioned, we now have uh, two steps of expansion of what's called the ADUs or accessory dwelling units, where people are allowed to have uh, both a detached ADU and an attached ADU called a junior ADU, and those are occurring in all of the neighborhoods. I live in a neighborhood where traditionally we've had many ADUs, and we're having more, but that's happening throughout much of the city. Um, so we're having a balance of increases in housing in each of those zones that are there. Um, as I stated before, I, I did not support uh, the concentration of so much of it along the El Camino corridor, but that doesn't mean that I think all that housing should uh, have high density housing in single family neighborhoods. I should also add, just uh, for a point of information, that for city council members, they're actually recused. They're not able to vote or participate in any way um, on approvals of projects that are w within 1,000 feet or, or more, in some cases, of, of their homes. Hi, my name's Rebecca, and first I just wanted to commend the city on the amazing job during the storms that all the surrounding city's power was out and Where are our, you? oh there you are so oh. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't spot you at the door and the our door power um, came, you know was out but it would come right back on so thank you for that um, <laughs> I had just a couple of things to run through quickly you were I've noticed all the cars the little Palo Alto Ubers and um, if they're doing a trial, I would love to also do a trial in the evening on week and on weekends because that seems like when a lot of people would want to use it. Um, the reason I came today is to get um, the big elephant in the room of Cubberly. Nobody's brought it up, and how we want to keep a lot of people want to keep Cubberly a public space, and that you can never reclaim that land once it's gone private. And and I don't know if we're going to talk about that today, but that's a big big concern in our area. The last piece that um, when we're talking about the uh, San Antonio homes, I'm assuming that's on the Athena uh, spot and that that had been private. They were going to develop it. They couldn't make enough money because the it was zoned for a certain amount of housing and then PAUSD purchased that land. But um, I just want to make sure that we're not increasing the capacity or density that is currently um, rated for to put in ultra-dense housing and just use what's already approved there. 
Um, thank you. Uh, really quickly, I'll touch on the Palo Alto link, which is the, the Palo Alto Ubers that we're seeing around town. They are kind of like Ubers. Um, the grant funding that we got for the pilot restricts the amount of hours that we can run. So it's only eight to six Monday through Friday right now. Um, but uh, we hear you and we're getting these comments that somebody makes a trip and then they want to be able to get home. So they need to uh, figure out like, you know, how to how to time their trip within that window. Uh, so we are looking at additional grants. Um, we've been applying actually for additional grants to expand the hours. We would love to expand it to earlier in the morning, later in the evening and the weekends. We really think that we're uh, and, and noting that we're just uh, we're still in the first month of the service trying it out but we've got a lot of riders already. A lot of people are taking trips and we're hearing comments and uh, the amount of ridership that we're seeing um, is really indicative of a service that could use expansion. Oh, and also we're working on expanding how many vehicles are available um, during the day as well. Okay. We're gonna have to cut off the questions at this point in time. One. All right, one more and, and then yeah, hi. You um, have an opportunity again after the second section if you have additional questions. Yeah, hi. My name is Sonia Bradsky. I'm neighbors with Rebecca. Um, I live in Green Meadow next to Coverly. Uh, I, I guess I want to talk about uh, three things. Uh, city services. Uh, when I look at the Enjoy catalog, most of the classes and offerings are all in North Palo Alto. So for us here in South Palo Alto, I just think, oh, what a pain. I really don't want to go across town to participate in those activities. And now you're building all this new housing in South Palo Alto, and so it really ought to be more activities in South Palo Alto for the people living here now and your new people that are coming, um, which includes city services, like Rebecca said, at Coverly. And how are you going to resolve that issue? Um, my second thing, uh, we've been remodeling our house f for a long time uh, and during the pandemic and to start off the whole thing it took us six months to get approval for our permit and then the city even lost our plans and I had to pay to get those huge sheets reprinted um, so that was my initial pain and now it's been a pain even getting all the um, uh, inspections done and there's been a shortage of staff with the city of Palto because I can speak to that because I'm suffering through this now for years um, and how are you going to resolve getting enough people so that people that do want to remodel can get through this process of permitting and getting their house inspections and then my third thing is I just want to say thank you for the Palo Alto 311 app which I use actually all the time and and the city's been very responsive you know, for the trees down and whatever I report. Just a, a quick comment on that. Uh, thank you on uh, the last point, as well as uh, Coverly will be coming up later in uh, the session this afternoon. Sorry about the uh, permits and inspections. Uh, we do know that that's an ongoing pain point. Uh, there are a couple of things in the works. One has been First, thank you to the City Council for providing compensation that's needed to make sure we can provide competitive wages for permit uh, staff, inspectors, and the like. Also, we are working with a number of contractors, so we supplement in-house staff with contractors. Believe it or not, even the contractors are having a hard time keeping staff. So it's a, it's a work in progress, uh, but we hear you. Recently, we did get back to next day inspections, which is a tremendous improvement over the, uh, I think we were over four weeks or more uh, backlog on inspections. So we're making some progress, but thank you. Noted. Okay, yes. Yeah, Sonia, thank you for uh, mentioning the permit issue. It's, uh, I have office hours every Sunday night, um, 8 to 10, and undoubtedly every single office hour, every single Sunday, there's like one or two people who are having permitting issues in our city. And so your story is not uncommon, and it's something that, to me, is actually really important. It's, it's a bit of a focus for me as well, just trying to make sure that we fix this problem. So I appreciate the work that the city manager is trying to do, but I think a lot more has to happen. And because a lot of people, like for instance, I was talking to the town and country people, and they're trying to uh, get the Scott Seafood replaced. And, and the guy was telling me, you know, normally it would take like three to four months, but now it's been over a year, right? And so it's, it's, it's hindering our retail, it's hindering people from finishing the projects, it's leaving these kind of 
endless construction projects and it's not good for us. So I think your point is well taken. It's something that I'm actually going to, um, I'm focusing on a lot and I'd love to follow up with you a little bit later just to hear the details. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on to the second section of uh, today's town hall meeting. And this is specifically uh, an update tailored to the neighborhood's interests. And we will be covering um, crime and police update. And uh, Chief Binder is going to cover that. We're then specifically going to get into the rail grade separation. And um, uh, Mr. Cami is going to cover that. And then we'll also be talking about coverly update, which I believe uh, uh, goes into your question about activities uh, in this area. So if I could turn this over to Chief Binder. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me in the back there? How great is it to have the sun out, huh? Uh, thank you, Penny, for having me, and thank you for everyone here for your attendance today. This is, this is really amazing. And one of the things that I like to do as your police chief is to let you know what a privilege it is to be the police chief here in Palo Alto. We have an overwhelming amount of public support, and this is just uh, exemplary of that support. And I also like to share, um, you know, as we get into crime, just how much uh, the safety of those that live and work and visit Palo Alto is to me. I take that responsibility as your police chief um, very seriously. And then thirdly, uh, just this opportunity to connect. If, if you got here early, you probably saw a police car out front, one or two, a couple officers. You know, it's really important to me that you get to know who we are and um, you know, events like this are, are really critical for that. And I like, to, I like to say we're more than the headlines you read in the paper. And so, you know, as your chief, I really want you to know uh, us more as the humans behind the badge and doing that service. And so I know I'm here to talk about crime and I'm gonna give you some, some safety tips. I just wanted to plug two kind of priorities that are happening right now for the department. Um, the first one is our recruiting, our hiring and our retention. And if you've heard um, Council Member Burt talk in the past, he's, he's called it the pipeline. Um, we have a number of vacancies in the police department, both in our sworn, which are the officers that wear the, the badge and, and the uniform, and our professional staff. That's our dispatchers, our records, our radio technicians, our evidence techs, that whole other side of the team that's kind of our infrastructure that helps us carry out our mission. And we do have a number of vacancies, uh, somewhat like some of the other city departments, and we're working really hard to, um, to get those restored. Just real quick question for you. If I was told today that I could hire a police officer, how long do you think it would take me before that officer is by on their own driving in a police car? Does anybody know the answer to that? 18 months. 18 months. We have anywhere from 18 to 24 percent failure rate also. And so when council member Burt talks about that pipe when he talked about that pipeline as we restored a lot of positions for us that's so critical um, and that's why our both our hiring and our retention for me as a police officer to be able to provide that services that you want and i do want to give a shout out to um, past and current councils as a whole they've been very supportive if you've been following along um, with restoring both our sworn and our professional staff and because of their work and their support just this year alone, I'm happy to uh, let you know we have an extra detective in our property um, um, bureau. We have what we call a special problems detail. It's a detail that works throughout the city based on crime trends or needs. And we added the PERT officer, that's a psychiatric emergency response uh, team, and that's an officer who works with a behavioral health clinician. So it's, it was the council's work and their support in conjunction with the police department that brought those things back. And as I look forward, we want to continue to kind of restore some of those services pre-pandemic. And so more PERT, more traffic, more detectives, there's a lot more of that that we want to do so we get you the service that you need. And the, lot, the second thing real quick, and then I'll get into crime, is community engagement. And, and after I was confirmed by the council last August, um, community engagement was, was really big for me. And we brought back National Night Out, first time since the pandemic. Um, last Thursday, we were down at Koopa Cafe. We call it Breaking with the Law. Officers were there having um, coffee with our community. Um, um, 
preview. We're coming to the south end in probably end of May or April. We want to have coffee down here. So I'd really encourage you to keep an eye for us on Twitter and our social media platforms. I'd love to see you there. And also we're revamping our Citizens Police Academy. And if you haven't had a chance to do that, I'd really encourage you to take part in that. These are all ways uh, that the police department, I as a chief, want to be able to communicate with you. All right, let's get into crime and crime prevention here. Um, anybody ever drive home or drive in their neighborhood and see a bunch of police cars and wonder what's happening? For sure, right? Good. I do that too in my own neighborhood. <clears throat> Luckily, I have the chief's number where I live, so I can just call him directly. There's three things I want to just point out to you about how you can, how you can stay in tune with what the police department is doing. Um, the police department does a really good job. We're very proactive in our um, what we call press releases. So when major events happen in the police department, we get those out. Those are all on our web page. I encourage you to go take a look and read those. They'll be very detailed. Generally, you'll see a lot of that information in the paper the next day. Um, the second thing is we uh, created what we call calls for service um, uh, data uh, display map. And so you can go on our website, calls for service that have been closed by the officers, meaning they've, they've been dispositioned. You can go back 24 hours and find out maybe what happened. So if you see something on next door where your neighbor says, hey, the cops were here and I saw three police cars down the street, that might be able to tell you. And the third way that you can um, kind of track what, what we're doing, and, and this is something I'm most proud of, is last year we unencrypted our radio. And Palo Alto is the only city in Santa Clara County that has an unencrypted radio. You can listen to us 24-7, 365. Thank you. And I'm really proud of that. Now, I'm going to date myself here. You don't have to go down to Radio Shack to buy a scanner. There's an app for that. So. Download it on your phone, listen to us. I will tell you anecdotally, when the storms came over New Year's Eve, um, people were texting me up in the community saying, hey, I was so grateful that I was able to listen to the police radio and find out what was happening. That's the type of transparency, that's the type of accountability, and that's the type of communication I want as your chief. All right, crime. Um, I'm very blessed to be the chief of a city that has a very low crime rate. Um, Palo Alto overall is very safe. Um, the most prevalent crimes we have is property crimes, which I'm sure I'll hear about. Um, and I'm happy to hear, I uh, want to hear from you about that. Know that the crime rates that we have here in our city are very similar to others uh, within the peninsula. Let me just give you the, the, the latest on our crime crews. They're, they're organized, they're very sophisticated. So our auto burglars, our catalytic converters, um, some of our residential burglars, we're finding that um, you know, back in the day when I, when I came on 26 years ago, some of those were individual type crimes. We're finding that we have crews that now work the whole entirety of the Bay Area. And so there's a lot of networking that goes on between my patrol officers and our detective bureau. We're trying to track and apprehend uh, these crews and the investigations that go on. It's very detailed and um, we're, doing a, we're doing the best we can with the resources that we have. You know, when I look specifically uh, for the crime that's happened, meaning down in your neighborhoods, it's gonna be no surprise to you. It's theft, our auto theft, our bike theft, our catalytic converter theft, it's residential burglaries. Um, and even though I can tell you, hey, I'm happy to not have violent crime, I just wanna acknowledge that even being a victim having something stolen from your house, from your vehicle, having your vehicle broken into, that could be very, um, that could be a very emotional experience. And I don't wanna minimize that to you as chief. And I don't wanna just say, hey, it's property crime, everything's cool, it's not. And so I just wanna make sure that you know that that's not lost on me and, and how violated it can feel to have someone come into your home and take your, take your stuff. And so, we have, like I said, and that's one of the reasons that I'm really excited that we've added a property crimes detective to our bureau. I'd like to add more so that way if we don't get what we're looking for on our front end with our patrol officers, there's follow up on the back end. Um, and now I need to wrap it up. I'll do one more minute and I'll wrap it up. Crime prevention. You guys are our eyes and ears. And, uh, you know, there's only so many officers out there. We're at limited capacity. I want to encourage you to be our eyes and ears. Here's the real critical what we're looking for. We are interested in people that we're, we are, let me take that back. We are interested in behavior that people are doing that is suspicious in, in criminal nature. So what that means is we, we're looking for activity and behavior, not necessarily people alone. So if you call our 
our comm center and say, hey, there's a suspicious person in our neighborhood, we're not coming out. We want that behavior, to, we want that person to be associated with behavior that is specific and that is related to crime. What might that look like? Someone looking into uh, car windows, peeking over your neighbor's gate, trying your front door. We have a whole lot of crime uh, prevention tips. I know since I'm running out of time, I know they're on the flyer. I would encourage you to go to our website um, and be partners with us. One last thing. Um, there, uh, last Thursday, a uh, staff report went out on license plate reader technology. We've done a lot of outreach on that. We have a web page if you're interested in that. We're going to be asking council for some action in a couple weeks. I would encourage you to do that. For Tammy, we have the PSB coming at the end of the year. So thanks, Brad and Public Works. We're going to be centrally located in the city. We're really excited for that opportunity to move into that uh, new building. And then that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll talk about uh, rail separation. Yeah. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Oh, thank you. All right, I'm back again. Philip Cammy, Chief Transportation Official. Looks like I found a new babysitter, too, so it's good news. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe a few. Yeah, I think she's forcing them to take her outside. Um, uh, so just to talk really briefly about the, um, the grade separation project, what we call Connecting Palo Alto, and I, I'm guessing that might have a council member or two that want to discuss this as well, but um, as I mentioned earlier, right now we're in the conceptual phase uh, working on Charleston, Meadow, and Churchill. Um, for uh, Churchill, we currently are evaluating two different options. Um, although um, council had set a preferred option, which is a partial underpass, um, and the uh, closure option, which is the backup. And the work that we're doing right now, um, well, actually, let me talk about Charleston and Meadow. For Charleston and Meadow, we're, we're looking at three different alternatives right now, um, a hybrid, um, a trench, and a, an underpass. And currently, right now, some of the work that we're doing is um, we've solicited some extra feedback from um, some really um, critical um, partners, including our Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee, um, and PAUSD, and are working with our Rail Committee on refining um, specifically the underpass alternatives and doing some extra studies um, that will help um, in order to evaluate the different alternatives in order to make decisions. So we're still in that phase. Um, we're expecting to have some refinements in front of the rail committee in the coming months. And we're also working with Caltrain, um, who would like to, um, at some point in this project, will need to um, likely take over the project because the construction is really within um, Caltrain right of way. So with that, I'm happy to uh, turn it over either. I'm not sure if. Oh, OK. Happy to turn it over to Kristen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kristen O'Kane. I'm the Community Services Director, and it's nice to see a lot of familiar faces and also some new faces, folks I've never met before. Um, so I'm here to give an update on Cubberly, and I'm going to focus on the future of Cubberly and also what's currently happening at Cubberly right now. Um, so just a little bit of background for those that don't know, Cubberly is about 35 acres. The city only owns eight acres of that 35. It's the corner by piazzas up to the tennis courts and back down to Middlefield. The school district owns the other 27 acres. Um, we, the city, lease um, some of the facilities, the theater, the gyms, the pavilion, which is also a gym, um, and then the athletic fields. Um, and we operate those as, um, as part of our community center facilities. So um, talking about the future of Cubberly, I know we've been having this conversation for a very long time on what's going to happen at Cubberly. Um, the, I think a positive news um, in that we're getting to um, start some more conversations with the school district is their board recently sent um, the city a letter inviting us to submit proposals to obtain more land. So they've decided that they would like to reserve 20 acres of their 27 
for a potential school at some point in the future. Um, and, but they're willing to give up seven acres, maybe even a little bit more. They um, said they'd be open to those conversations. So they've invited us to submit some sort of proposal to transfer that land to the city. So staff is working on that now, and myself and um, some staff from Ed Chicada's office are working on what that proposal might be. There's several different options on how we might do that. Um, and then we'll bring that to council probably first in a closed session because it is, um, you know, negotiating a land agreement. So we'll be doing that very soon in the next few months. So hopefully that gets us moving again into thinking more um, seriously about what we might be able to do at Coverly in the future. Um, there are a lot of things that still go on at Coverly. Um, and I did hear the question about having more activities and programs in South Palo Alto. Um, so I will bring that back to my team and see how we might be able to expand some of our programs. Um, the issue, of course, is space. Um, but we're very open and willing to expand that if that's um, what the residents are looking for. So just some other things happening at Coverly. You may know that um, Palo Verde Elementary School is temporarily there for this academic year. Um, they're going to move out, and then Hoover is going to move in for two years. Um, they're in the, the parking lot in those portables. Um, the gyms, as you know, the gyms A and B are closed. They've been closed for a year now due to um, some pretty significant damage because of some water line breaks, and they were it was hot water that leaked underneath the gym floors. So as you can imagine, that was um, quite a disaster. Um, so they've been closed for about a year. Um, we've had some consultants come out. There is some remediation work that needs to be done due to mold that's um, growing, but um, Brad Eggleston's team is on it and they're going to be um, getting some quotes to get the remediation work done and then they'll redo the floors, the walls, um, and hopefully get that back up. Um, the not super great news is that could take up to a year um, just because of the process to get all that done. Um, in the meantime, we're still allowing people to use the pavilion and some of our other spaces. Um, we know that's not nearly enough space um, for recreation activities in South Palo Alto, um, but we're, we're working with different organizations to find them alternate space as well. Um, I did want to mention, um, and I see um, Parks and Rec Commissioner Ann Cribs is here. Um, she and some other um, Parks and Rec Commissioners have sort of reignited the conversation about a recreation and wellness center. Um, you may have heard this also re been referred to as a public gymnasium. Um, we like to call it a recreation wellness center because it would encompass more than just a gymnasium. Um, we had a public meeting here in this room on March 7th, and then there was a public survey that was available um, from March 7th to March 21st that asked some specific questions about if we were to um, further plan and explore a wellness center, what types of programs would the community want there? What sorts of amenities um, or in the facility would you like to see? And then we asked some questions about the location. So there's been no location selected. I want to make that really clear. But there is um, a location that's been identified as um, to be further explored, and that's at Greer Park. Um, so this topic I will be um, discussed Tuesday night at the Parks and Rec Commission meeting. I'll be giving a presentation on the results of those surveys. So if you're interested, um, you can come to that meeting. Um, you can also, um, I think, watch online. Um, and you can comment as well at that point if you would like um, to add any insight into um, that proposal. So um, I think that's all I have. Um, I did, there was a question about the dog parks or the dog um, services. I did have a conversation with Virginia outside, so I will follow up with her. Um, and 
pass that information along to our planning department as well as our park staff. So thank you all and happy to answer questions when the time comes. When you have a question, if uh, you can either address it to the group as a whole or if there's a specific person, whether it be a council member or one of the staff members, please feel free to address it either way. All right. Um, it is my view that we should not use the Coverly land for housing. I think it should be maintained as a community center or educational facilities. I'd love to personally see a, a wood shop or a metal shop or an auto repair shop that could be used by the community, not a commercial thing, or something like that, or classes or whatever, but not as housing, because once it's housing, it's never gonna be anything but housing. Thanks. Question? Hello, <clears throat> I'm Pat Morris, and um, I have been going to a program called Heart Fit for Life, which is housed now at uh, one of the rooms at Coverly. And um, I think it is a positively wonderful program. And it's done a lot for me. I had heart surgery quite a few years ago. And I'm exercising all the time and walking everywhere and doing things that I didn't think I would ever do. So um, I just I just want to say that having that at Put Coverly is wonderful for me. Um, I suppose it would be elsewhere, but it's it's wonderful at Coverly. Did you have a question there? No. There's a question in the back here. And yeah, the the new expanded Palo Alto with eighty thousand people could probably use a second pool like the one at Rinconada. How about Coverly? Hi, my name's Oliver, I'm uh, Green Meadow. Uh, so I actually brought my daughter with me today and she goes to multiple classes over in Coverly. Like uh, she has dance class over there, They've uh, she has her scout troop and everything over there. So is the, the actual classrooms of Coverly, is that under PAUSD? Or is that under, and, and, the, and I'll tell you real quick and so I can end here, is that the classrooms are in like very bad disrepair. And we really like, we enjoy the area so much. And I kind of think it's, it's kind of like, you know, there's a, there was that keep San Francisco weird, but it's, it's really like these small classes that I think are really, really important to our community. But right now the space is really bad and we'd love to be able to understand how we can inspire people to improve them, right? Yeah, thanks for that question and for the other questions about Coverly related to the pool and other um, public spaces. So some of the classrooms at Coverly are owned by the school district. So it depends where you are, like buildings A and B, if that means anything, which are more closer to the theater area, those are school district. As you get further towards piazzas, those are city owned. Um, and I agree with you, they're in <laughs> disrepair. Um, definitely, Coverly needs a facelift. Um, and I think the exciting part of that is all the things that you've mentioned here today are possibilities for the future of Coverly. Um, the, our vision that we did with the Coverly concept plan a few years ago showed all the possible things we could have there and they it really could be an amazing amazing space for the community for South Palo Alto. Um, I'm gonna keep being optimistic that we're gonna get there. Um, and like I said, I'm hoping this initial conversation with the school district that we're having is gonna sort of lead us in that right direction. So I agree with you. Um, I know Brad's team in um, Public Works is doing maintenance on those probably weekly. I mean, there's things that are breaking constantly that they're trying to fix and keep up with. So um, hopefully hopefully we will get there soon. Can I add? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. I just, um, you know, Kristen so polite. I want to kind of be a little blunt here. The, as, to your point, the facilities are in really bad shape. So part of the decision we have ahead of us, even on the gym repairs that she mentioned recently, or uh, just a few minutes ago, is do we keep investing money, what could be a million dollars, into 
band-aids on on a really old building versus scrape it and build a new one and uh, it's very easy to say scrape and build a new one fortunately it takes a lot of money so there will be a point at which uh, we may even need to come back to the voters in order to uh, ask for your permission to uh, get some additional funds uh, to invest in a facility hi my name is Deborah Simon I'm actually the chairperson of Friends of Carberly and I grew up in Green Meadow um, so I have been associated with the Paltrow Chamber Orchestra for 53 years now, and I know I don't look like that could be possible because I look so young, but it's true. I started playing with them when Carberly was still Carberly, um, when they were using M2, and they're still in M2. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that, and I know there's a lot of decisions and a lot of work to be done, but I just want to encourage the city council to really do your best to come up with some good proposals and to be a cooperative member with the school board and to move it forward because Carberley is a well-loved and used facility, and we all just want it to be as best as it can be. Thanks. So I just wanted to add um, the... Uh, the discussion or the staff shared that we recently had this um, letter proposal from the school district to uh, have the city come forward with a proposal for a land trade. And we've gone back and forth on Coverly for a long while. Uh, the school district, uh, when they were in a big growth period, uh, believed that they needed to retain all of their. Uh, 27 acres actually a dozen years ago they said and we want your eight acres back and we said no way uh, but then we had just a log jam for a, a decade where we had great visioning on what Coverly could be and it required this collaboration with the school district on a joint facility concept that was not in their plans and their interests and their needs and I think we wasted a lot of time trying to force the district to do something that was against their needs and interests. We've now got an opportunity to break through this log jam. The council had looked at this a year ago and one alternative, actually the eight acres that we have were because 20 years ago, uh, we swapped it when they needed what was then term and now Fletcher Middle School. They needed that back for a third middle school and we got eight acres at Coverly in, uh, in exchange for eight acres at then Terman. The interesting thing is the playing fields at Terman are actually called, or at Fletcher, are called Terman Park. They are still city-owned land. We have allowed the district to basically use still city-owned land that is technically city park land as all the playing fields for the middle school. And everybody thought they were part of the district. They, they aren't. That's a real great candidate for the swap. I don't know whether that'll be what will occur, but this is one of the things we've been dis discussing over the recent months. We need to move quickly on this um, because as was mentioned, we have this prospect of a, a, a family uh, recreation center uh, and we have to make a decision on where that's going to be. If that's coming through largely private donations, those donors are not going to sit around while we take a long time to make a decision and so there's a sense of urgency now but it's also a great opportunity i think it's this land swap and some of the other things happening are finally the way that we can make break this log jam that's been there for too long yeah and just quickly add i agree with council member bird on the opportunities here i'm, I'm optimistic that we can get something done and again as a as a South Palo Alton for a long time, you're, sorry, I, my wife says that all the time, you're being too loud, sorry, um, I, I get passionate, uh, but as a South Palo Alton, hear the, the frustrations that you have, for as long as I can remember, South Palo Alto, we've always gotten the short end of the stick when it comes to services, community services and, and opportunities, uh, so really excited for some of the opportunities. Cubberly is a true gem. There is a great opportunity. There's a diversity of interests clearly in the room and in the community for what we're going to be able to get done there. Please be a part of that process as we move forward, but I think we're going to be able to make it happen. I think exciting things are coming to South Palo Alto, just like this wonderful facility that we're in right now. Yeah, so guys, thank you so much for bringing up Coverly. I think Coverly is one of those 
um, gems in our in our community that we just really haven't harnessed. I mean, as as you guys mentioned, it's been degrading, it's been underutilized, and there's so much opportunity there. And it's a shame that it's been taking so long for us to kind of get moving on it. I do think there's a new opportunity available now, and I think it's important that we move quickly because, you know, every year that goes by that we're not really using it is lost opportunity. It's something that could be adding value to the community. So I, I for one, think that we need to move quickly on it, and I think the school board's on board. But I also think it's important that we look at the school school district as a partner, right? Because it's not us versus them. So I think it's important that we collaborate with them. And um, I think someone here mentioned about you know maybe making it some like makerspace or something like that. And I think there's a lot of innovative things we could do with this space. So I'm I'm really interested in hearing those ideas. And thank you guys for suggesting it. But I I for one want to see some real ut utility out of Coverly. Thanks. Thank you. We have a question right here. Yep. Hi, my name is Carmen Rodwell. I'm a neighbor at Green Meadow. Uh, I'm also the vice president of the Green Meadow um, uh, Neighbors Association Board. And I have three points that I just want to make. One is that, as all of you know, and most of the people here know, Green Meadow is a historic neighborhood. And uh, all of us who live there appreciate and take very good care of our neighborhood. Um, we rely on the city to keep our neighborhood historic and the way it is. And um, in many instances, we have been really disappointed in the process and how permits, permits for buildings have been issued with this regard to the Eichler um, neighborhood and to how the historic neighborhood should look and feel. And um, we, in order, to, I mean, the city has to give the permits for these houses to happen. There is an architectural review board at Green Meadow that is willing to support and give their opinions on how those houses should look or should not look. And they have not been approached in the way they should have. Um, and we have some really non eichler looking houses that have come up in our neighborhood recently. And it's really painful to see the neighborhood degrade in that way. Um, my other uh, point is regarding Coverly as well, especially to the use of Coverly um, by soccer games and by the upcoming schools. Um, Palover, the use of Coverly has been fairly unnoticeable. I happen to live on Nelson, so all the traffic coming and going through the back of Coverly comes in front of my house. Um, but I am really worried about the um, I blanked out on the name of the school, but the school that is coming up next, Hoover, sorry. So Hoover coming there, there's a lot of people commuting from all over Palo Alto into Hoover. There's going to be a lot of traffic and there's probably going to be issues. There's always issues. There's a lot of children biking through our neighborhood into the public schools and those cars are going to be a problem. There's going to be a lot of people rushing in and out to drop their kids off to school and we're gonna suffer from that. So I would like, the city to take care of that. And um, my other point quickly is just to appreciate Virginia's comment about the underuse areas in Coverly, in the parks around Middle, um, around Coverly and uh, Mitchell Park, um, areas that are not being used during the day. So the families in the neighborhoods around here that we have dogs, we could use them. That would be really appreciated. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Amy Lee. Oh, oh. Uh, hi, my name is Amy Lee, and I live in the Green neighborhood, uh, Green Meadow neighborhood. And I just wanted to add uh, just a couple more thoughts to the Cubberly uh, buildings. That it is such a bikeable and walkable um, facility. So you know the surrounding neighborhoods around Cubberly. It would be wonderful if we were able to improve the buildings, and you know we would be able to to travel, you know, not by car, but by, by walking on foot and also by bike. And, you know, our kids can, as they get older, they could be more independent. They'll be able to do that. And uh, yes, I definitely, you know, support the classes, the activities, all the different interests and all the different ages that, you know, would really benefit from a community community services center in Coverly. Um, also, I just wanted to put it out there. It would be such a shame to knock down such a beautiful building. I know it's old, but it's got good bones, great foundation. Um, it just needs a lot of work inside, you know? Um, I'm not an architect, but I feel like if, you know, architects were to look, walk through that they would, they would see that very clearly.
Thank you. Uh, Carol Gleason, Charleston Court. I'm a little confused when you were talking about the Coverly and the term uh, land and German. Are you suggesting that we swap part of those acreage that the school district owns for the Terman, and then, then the city gets that, the extra land for, uh, from Coverly? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, that would be one uh, possible land swap. Um, I, I should have noted that uh, one important thing is there are neighbors to that, uh, what are, it's called Terman Park, the, um, the Fletcher playing fields, who have a pathway and other access to those fields on the weekends. That has to be part of the agreement so that their access to those fields would remain unchanged. Uh, Curtis Gleason from uh, Charleston Court. I notice our police chief is anxiously waiting for some question to respond to. <laughs> Not really, I just look that way. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> what I'm wondering is, are, are there any plans to monitor the traffic on, middle, on Middlefield Speedway? Yeah, so are you saying there's speeding going on in Palo Alto, sir? <laughs> Shock, shock. Um, the answer is yes. You know, unfortunately, in 2020, we had to cut uh, our traffic team along with some other uh, budget cuts that we had to do. The good news is, is, is just a couple months ago, I restored the traffic sergeant. So you'll actually see a Palo Alto cop on a motorcycle out there. If you get a ticket from him, though, don't don't blame me because you, you guys asked for him. And then the hope is that as we continue, like I spoke to earlier, as we continue to look at restoring the police department, I would love, I, there's a lot of things I would love, but I would love in part to put a traffic team back out there. Thank you for the question. Question in the front. Hi, um, I'd like to get uh, about the grade separation. Um, I'd just like to know what is the time frame? Um, when is decision going to be needed? I heard mention about um, Things going to be turned over to Caltrain, uh, so I'd like to understand that. Who makes the final decision? And, um, you know, I'm curious because I remember a few years ago, there was a very thorough study done. I think the city uh, hired a, 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 a company that did a great job. I remember having to read through a very thorough uh, analysis of each of the options, looking carefully at their three-dimensional looks, looking at the estimated cost and also estimated time that it would take to do this because that's going to inconvenience us for years. And my husband and I made very, very careful choices and we didn't actually agree on our choices. We voted on it. What happened to all of those results? Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Of course, I stepped away to get a cookie right when something came back <laughs> up for grade separation. Um, so I just want to note that these are, as I described earlier, huge projects, several, several years away, um, you know, based on um, several different things, not just making the decision, which as you noted yourself in your own family even was a complicated decision. Um, but it's, it's a very, very tough decision because all of these different alternatives have different drawbacks or different um, things that are beneficial to them. So I uh, just want to acknowledge that. Um, but the other challenge is funding because these projects are really, really expensive. And we do have some funding that's, um, that's directly um, um, set aside for these projects. We have um, some portion of our um, local sales tax, the Measure K um, sales tax, and also um, VTA's or Santa Clara County's um, measure um, that has funding set aside. But that's not going to be enough to complete these projects. So. Right now, we're applying for grant funds to try and um, continue these projects and move them forward in order to match the funding. Or I should say, we're going to match the funding that we would get, hopefully, from like federal funds in order to move these projects forward. Um, as far as moving into um, the next phase um, and really getting um, Caltrain uh, aboard, um, and, and I just want to say that's a little bit of a, a um, complicated issue. So we're still trying to work out the details of our agreement with Caltrain. Um, 
but I, I also want to say that I think um, I don't want to make it seem like we're going to lose local control um, over the project. We're still planning to um, have the project selected, the alternatives selected locally. It's just in the end, we will need Caltrain's approval um, for whatever we want to do. So that's that's the, the kind of nuance there. But they actually do want to take over um, and lead the project um, at 15%, what we call 15%. But we would still be involved throughout the process. So we're never going to step away from this project and they're never going to come and say, this is the alternative that you're going to build because this is what we want. It's always going to be um, locally selected. We have one question there and then one in the front. Um, uh, Eileen Brooks from Charleston Gardens. And I had this just wacky idea about Coverly that um, if city could could plant the seed for us, I think we could probably get some interest in um, community work days there. Uh, I think there would be enough people who would paint those classrooms and, and replaster a little bit. I mean, we've all been around the block a few times and do these things in our own homes. And so I think that if that's um, a way to get the repairs done a little bit quicker, that's something you should look into maybe. I, I have a question for City Council. There's been an undercurrent here of South Palo Alto versus North, et cetera. Um, I learned recently that the state, in its wisdom, has mandated that we can't have at-large elections anymore. They have to go to by districts. And is the city planning for that, and when? You're shaking your head no. OK, that's. There is, there is not a mandate. Um, there are different cities that and school districts that have um, had uh, been challenged by uh, private parties uh, to have district elections if it was provable that it was unrepresentative. Right now, we, we have a pretty good balance of um, where our council members live um, between North and South Palo Alto. So I, I think we're pretty good there right now. Hi, I'm uh, Bacha from Grendel. Um, if you try to take a left from Middlefield into San Antonio, it can sometimes at peak hours take 10, 15 minutes. Um, my worry is that, you know, with the Carmel Village and all the plenty of um, dense uh, housing they have down in San Antonio, um, which is great. I mean, people need places to live but the same roads are serving twice or thrice the amount of traffic. I'm worried if it just like Palo Alto thinks it's Mountain View's problem and Mountain View thinks it's Palo Alto's problem. That's one thing. The other is uh, near Briarwood Way. I don't know if it's a roundabout or traffic circle exactly, but everybody, there's plenty of people who just get confused and it seems like kind of unsafe. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carrie Wagner. I live in Charleston Meadows. And um, South Palo Alto, speaking of an increase in population and how we want people, we want kids on their bikes, pa South Palo Alto desperately needs a separated pedestrian bike crossing for the railroad. Um, and I'd like that. We, just, we also need one. I understand that could go in with the grade separations, but we could use one completely separate from those projects, hopefully sooner rather than later. If we want the kids riding their bikes to gun, this is how we do it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I want to really just quickly note that we are um, getting ready fairly soon to kick off our bicycle and pedestrian transportation plan update. And um, one key aspect of that is going to be a robust um, public engagement. And we would love um, feedback such as yourself or such as the comment that you provided um, that's going to help us to determine um, how to connect networks, what things are missing, where there's gaps. And the example that you provided um, is a perfect example of that. And that would be a project that, you know, potentially could be identified through that. Um, and then we can move forward.
Hello? No. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, if, if you have questions that we didn't have time to answer, um, we definitely def we definitely want to hear from you. There are two ways of submitting in. Uh, there are flyers at the back of the uh, the room where you came in, and I recommend that you pick that up. Uh, at this point in time, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Council Member uh, Tanaka, uh, who will provide some closing remarks. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. So, esteemed community members, council colleagues, and staff, uh, as we approach the conclusion of this town hall meeting, I'd like to express my gratitude for your active participation and valuable contributions throughout our discussions. Your presence here today is a testament to your commitment to making our city an even better place to live. Through the course of this event, we've shared our thoughts, concerns, and ideas, all in the spirit of collaboration and mutual understanding. It is through open dialogue and the connections that we forge that we shape the future of our beloved community. As we move forward, let's continue to work hard, hand in hand, to address the challenges, seek innovative solutions that foster growth, sustainability, and inclusivity. With your support, passion, and commitment, we can transform our collective vision for Palo Alto into a reality. I'm inspired by your interest and dedication you demonstrated today. And as Penny mentioned, I encourage you to continue to be involved in our life of our community. Your voice, input, and action make a significant difference in shaping the city we all cherish. Thank you for your valuable time and engagement. I now invite our organizer, Penny Ellison, who will explain where citizens can go find information to engage further. Thank you. First of all, I want to say a whole lot of thank yous to every person who took time out of their, this beautiful day today to engage with your, your government, your electeds, and your city staff. I want to thank our city staff for coming in on a weekend. They're all around you. <laughs> These good people work hard for us every day. Um, and here they are on a weekend, too, helping us out. So thank you. Thank you all. Um, and I really want to thank our city council members. And I want to remind everyone that these people are volunteers. And what they've picked up, basically, is a full-time job <laughs> on top of the one they get paid for. Um, to, to lead and guide our city staff. I want to thank you for the work I know you do every single day for our community. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to the good volunteers who helped us out today. Scott Peterson, our moderator, Arthur Keller, Mike Guy, Peter Toskovich, who's out here somewhere, and, <laughs> and Edith Lynn, who's been our timekeeper today. Thank you all for your help. <laughs> and last but not least, I really hope that your engagement with city government will get deeper and better. I can tell you from personal experience, it is a very rewarding thing to work on projects with the city and see them move forward and see them make our city better. We're sitting in one of those projects right now. I worked along with many other volunteers to support the bond measure project that made this building happen. It is citizens who get stuff moving. So I want to encourage all of you to pick up some of the flyers and don't just walk by that table. Look at those flyers, figure out like what areas interest you. Maybe you're interested in traffic, maybe you're interested in um, you know, utilities or Cobberly specifically. Perhaps you'd like to sit on a Parks and Recreation Commission. Maybe you're really interested in traffic and you'd like to start attending a few Planning and Transportation Commission meetings just to learn and figure out if that's something you'd like to dive deeper on. So there are lots of ways you can help our city government um, and I hope that you will. I hope you will just Dedicate some of your time to, I, I know many of you are already doing wonderful volunteer work, but um, please, you know, step in and step up. Show up at City Hall and start looking at agendas. Once a week you can get, one of the things back there is a 
list where you can sign up to get city council agendas on a regular basis that just pop into your email on Thursday afternoon and when you have time over the weekend, you can just look over the agenda and see if there's anything that interests you and show up if you want or you can just show up on Zoom. But, but that's, an, that's a way to get your toe in the water. Anyway, thank you for coming today. Thank you for and being part of our city.